Gotcha. Yeah, could be. All right. This is Monday, right? I mean, I'm in, and I'm in the right room. Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, all right. Um, what we are going to do is we are going to focus on the des we're going to we're going to focus on the design part of web development for a while, and we're going to talk about what constitutes a well-designed web page and website. Let me see. I did this over the summer and it worked out pretty well. Let's see if I can do it now. All right, a demonstration. All right. I have three markers. Let me find something. I will if I was daring, I'd, I'd try to balance my coffee on top of it. Let's try that, right? No guts, no glory. There, there we go. Look. I can balance the coffee on three markers. Yay. And go Browns, by the way. Now, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to mess up the computer equipment and burn myself and make a mess, but what would happen if I moved one of these markers? Well, we can see everything comes crashing down, right? Um, in web development, there's sort of three pillars as well. And for a site to be successful, all three pillars needs to be strong. If one of those pillars is not so strong, then again, the site sort of comes crashing down. And I'm going to say the three pillars of a successful web page are content. There's a cliche in web development, content is king, right? People come to your site not to enjoy your mad design skills, but to get whatever content you have. And this is true regardless of the kind of site that you have, right? If you are a news site, people come to your site to get the news, to read the news. If you are a site about a business, people go to the website to find out about the business's hours and maybe what the business does or how to contact the business or whatever. So the content of your site is, is what drives people to your site. And having good content is key to um, having a successful site. You know, to make a company mind for visiting your site, and they want to achieve them. Besides having good content, which Right? I mean, we're not going to say, well, content is important, but yeah, we don't really care if it's good content or not. Of course we want it to be good content. Remember that if you can't find something on a website, that's pretty much the same as it not being there. Right? I mean, to say, well, you know, that content's on my website. To click 65 times to get to it, or something like that. All right? Along with content is the organization of that content. Next pillar. And again, these don't really go in any order, although I do like to talk about content first. This is the I should have saved that for last, but I guess we can talk about these in other orders. This is the execution of everything else. In other words, we have an idea to put something on a page. We want to put a video on a page, let's say, for example. 
Well, we have to know the right tags to put a video on the page. We have to know technically what are the tags to put a video on the page. We want to another website. We have to know technically how we write that link. All right. This is following the language of the web. All right, and following the standards of the web of how you do certain things. And in this class, we're going to focus on a couple of technologies. We're going to focus on HTML and CSS, the, those two technical aspects. But um, there's also JavaScript, which we touch on in this class. And if you take other courses, there are things like PHP and ASP.NET and all these other technologies that you need to know, even some database technologies you need to know in putting it together. So the technical pillar of web development is making sure you can do what you set out to do, making sure you have the technical knowledge and expertise to do what you have set out to do. mistake that people make when they talk about web design is they focus on making it they focus on making it look good all right now I'm certainly not going to talk about an aspect of web design I'm not going to say you want your web page to look ugly right or you don't care how your web page looks of course you want it to look good of course you want it to be visual appealing visually appealing However, that is not the sole reason why we design. Design, if you will, sort of brings all these things together, right? An your content, right? That's design. You have to plan to how you're going to present your information. Any topic under the sun, you could organize it a couple different ways, right? Well, you have to think about what makes the most sense for your particular problem, for your particular audience, and so on. You know, if I was going to have a website about animals, it's a very broad topic, right? But I could group them a couple different ways. Well, what's a couple different ways I could group um, a website about animals? And I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally being vague, but what, what, what are some ways that we could group a website about animals? Animal types, dogs, cats, birds, whatever. All right. What's another way that we could do it? By species? Yeah, by, by, the, by the scientific way. All right. And that's, that's a good thought. We could group them, number one, by the way that just ordinary people see them. All right. Uh, or number two, we could, we could uh, group them uh, the way that a scientist would see them. You know, there's going to be a lot of overlap there, but it would be su subtle difference. Now, how would you decide which is the appropriate way? Well, is your site for ordinary people or is your site for scientists? That would help you decide that. What would be another way that you could group a, a site about animals? What, if you're talking about pets specifically, yeah, indoor versus outdoor, absolutely. By region. In other words, what animals are natively found in North America? What animals are natively found in South America, Asia, Africa, Europe, Australia? All right. So these are all reasonable ways that we could do it. I mean, it's not like uh, you know any of these ideas we're looking at and say, oh, that's ridiculous. Right? These all make sense. And how would you choose it? Well, you'd have to know a little more about the problem that you're trying to solve. Why are you creating this site? Who, are the, uh, who is the audience for the site? And so on. The idea, though, is with you to make. And another way to describe design is deliberately making choices of what you right? 
Um, there may be some things that you simply don't want to have on your website or don't want to do on your website. I'll give you an example. I did um, work in, uh, couldn't even tell you what year it was, uh, early 2000s, let's put it that way, on a jewelry site, a site for a big jewel, jewelry, jewelry retailer, right? And we could sell jewelry online, or they could have sold jewelry online, but they decided not to. We as a development team decided, and again, this was working with the user, decided not to. Well, why don't you think they decided to sell jewelry online? Okay. Okay. Okay, that's a good point. Number one, your organization would need the infrastructure to do that. In other words, they would need a shipping department. They would need uh, a way to uh, accept payments and, and to ensure that things were done securely and all those things. And again, that's going to add time and money to the project. Now, that might be okay, right? Because there's a lot of companies that do sell their goods online, right? And they figured out how to solve these things and they're profitable, I would imagine, all right? But why do you think specifically a jewelry company wouldn't choose to sell their stuff online? Exactly. All right. If I'm buying a book, let's say, you know, um, usually what I want is probably not necessary for me to pick up and hold the book and look at it, right? I mean, I guess in some cases it's valuable to do that, you know. Um, for example, I look for a book with a certain kind of print in it that's not too small a print. So it's useful for me to actually have a copy of the book in front of me. But in a lot of cases, I could, you know, I could order a book online that I want without having to see it. But if I'm going to spend thousands of dollars on a necklace or a ring or something like that, an engagement ring, let's say, or, or a, a very special gift for someone or whatever, David's right. I'm going to want to actually look at it, all right? You know, a picture, you know, Heck, you know, pictures they could take under perfect lighting conditions. They could Photoshop them and retouch them to make it look better. All those kinds of things. Hey, if I'm spending that much money, I want to look at it and see if I really like it. So the thought was is that most people probably wouldn't want to buy high-end jewelry online. All right. And it would cost a lot more to develop that aspect of the site. So yeah, maybe they would get a few more sales. But those sales wouldn't be justified, wouldn't justify the cost that it takes to do that. So I would call that a design issue, even though typically if you read textbooks on web design, they're never going to talk about that kind of design issue. But design, in my mind, is making all the little, the millions of little decisions about your site. How are you going to use the technology? Are you going to have one style sheet for all of your pages versus having style sheets for different sections of the site? Are you going to this content. How are you going to organize the content? Make and design. All right, um, and it affects the site and it affects the success of the site. So the whole process of planning. And making these decisions, the choices to be made about are the things that people typically think of when they talk about web design, and that is the visual language being used. All right. Occasionally, what I do is I'll pull up a a, a website in a different language and take a look at it and see if we can guess just based on the appearance. What the what the what the kind of site is, all right? Let's see. 
We do have, I do have a couple of international students, so I might not be able to use the ones that I've used in past semesters. Does anyone speak French? Okay, we'll go with that one. In the past, what I, what I often do is I use uh, Iceland, Icelandic, but I know that is, isn't Danish kind of close to Icelandic? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, so you'd, you'd have an unfair advantage at this. So we, uh, so I had to go a different direction. So let's, good, good. I had two years of high school uh, of French, which means that I don't know it either. Yeah, I, um, and, and I also, maybe when I did this, before, do you know German, David? Okay, I, I kind of remembered that, so I deliberately did not pick German because of that. So let's try to find a page in French. <laughs> uh oh. this will do. All right, remember, I hope none of you are cheating and, and secretly know French well, but where's the navigation on this? Pardon me? Yeah. All right, here's the navigation. All right. Where do we go to search for something? Right here. All right. Um, well, we'll go for the obvious ones. Where is the copyright information? Right here. All right. What would you say these things are? Whoops. These things over here. Secondary navigation or, or other links, links, things that might be important but aren't necessarily like the top reason that people visit this site. In this section here, how many articles are there? In this section here, there's four. All right. Now, you might say, well, yeah, that's obvious. It's obvious because if I look at this page, you know, this page is decently designed. You know, we could argue the, the pluses and minuses of it and, and nothing is perfect, but this page is decently designed. All right? So you can, without even understanding the language, if a page is well designed, you can come to some conclusions about the content without even reading the page, without even understanding the language. There's a... There's a book in, in our library about web design that says, don't make me think, all right? And again, the idea is this. It's not that the people visiting your site aren't smart or can't read or whatever, all right? The idea is that they have other stuff to do. They are not coming to your site to be enthralled and to spend hours admiring how beautiful your site is and things like that. For the most part, and again, we're focusing on standard business websites. 
people come to your website to get some information. All right. Now there's other websites, right? You know, there are sites for entertainment where you go and you're not really looking for any information. You want to be entertained, right? So that kind of site to design might be a little different simply because people have different goals when visiting the site. All right, but let's consider some of the techniques that they used on this page and um, we'll see and, and, we'll, and, and we can form some ideas about what, what I call, and other people call it too, so I'm not saying I invented the term, but I like to call it visual language. Whereas just by looking at it, things are communicated. First of all, how did you know that this is the search bar? Okay, that, that's true, all right. If you played a little bit of a detective, yeah, that looks like the word research. But I'll bet you you could guess that's the search bar even if you didn't notice that. Okay, exactly. That's where search bars are on web pages, <laughs> all right? Um, one of the a very famous uh, uh, expert on web design, Jacob Nielsen, says that you have to remember that people spend more time on other sites than on your site, all right? So one of the things about websites is that there are certain conventions that are followed. Now that doesn't mean that you have to do the same thing that everyone else does, but be aware that if you do things differently than the way that most websites do, you better make sure that the way you're doing it is clear to your users. All right? The navigation, we could determine by, number one, the little arrow. Number two, as we put our mouse over it, the um, appearance changes. And number three, this is typically the section of the page where navigation is found. Navigation is usually found in like, well, three or four places. Sometimes it's along the top. Sometimes it's along this side. Sometimes it's along this side. So in looking at that, there's a few links on the top. But of those places, yeah, this looks different. Copyright information and extra links, well, again, that's another thing that by conventions at the bottom of the page, all right? How could we tell that there's four articles here? Well, there's four of everything. There's four images, so one image per article. There are, well, there's three lines, but those three lines separate this section into four pieces. There are four of these things, which are in different color. There are four of these things, which are in bigger font, the headline, and so on. So all these things are subtly communicated to you through language. So as we learn CSS, we're going to learn all these different techniques for doing a whole bunch of different things. We've already learned about doing things with color. We can change fonts. We can change font sizes. We can change all these things. But what we want to do is we want to figure out a way that we can use those things, not just to make the page look nice, but to help with the visual language of the page, to help with the visual communication so that people at a glance get a sense of how your page is organized and what each part of the page means. All right. One, uh, one web designer once said that when they look at web pages, they like consciously like blur their eyes. Like, you know, yeah, you can like focus your eyes. For me, it's easy. I just take off my glasses, right? My eyes are already blurry. But that's almost the same way as with the different language, right? If you take off your glasses or blur your eyes, you should still have an idea about like what the major sections of the page are. Actually, I have horrible eyes. I can see that there's a computer monitor there, but who knows what's on it. All right, let me, all right, now we're back to, to normal. All right, so the three pillars of web design.
next few days is going to be we make for everything. All right. Everything that you do on a site, you make a choice about. Even if you don't make a choice, you've made a choice, <laughs> right? If I don't choose what color to make my page, I have chosen the colors for my page. And what would the colors of my page be? Black and white, or whatever the browser is default setting is. All right? So if I don't make a choice about something, that choice is made by me. All right? The idea is, is to make an effective page and to effectively communicate it. We want to consider all the options and, and make our choices. All right. I want to hear a list of characteristics that you would consider as making a page or a site well designed. Or we can do the opposite. All right. Sometimes it's easier to think you know, what makes a page bad design, you know, poorly designed. All right, so let's put, and again, we can either, we can phrase it as a positive, or we can say a negative. What's the characteristic of a well-designed page or site? All right. All right. Oh, page considers options their perspective and goal. All right. That's a good place to start out because that really is sort of a, a guiding light for this. Any topic that we can think of that we're doing a page for, um, the audience is critical, right? Think of a news site. Think of a science page on a news site, all right? Now, the site could be for young people, you know, high school age or even younger. The site could be for adults. All right, for the general population. The site could be for scientists. The site could be for science teachers. Each one of those things is going to be a different site, right? It's going to ha it could be organized differently. It could look differently, all right? And it could contain all kinds of things. Um, all kinds of aspects of it could be different. So first rule, really, of any communication is to consider your audience, you know? If you went in, let's say you were doing a speech about, you know, anything, about swimming, and you went in and gave the same speech to a group of senior citizens as you gave to a group of grade schoolers, probably not going to work for at least one of those groups, maybe both of them. So considering your audience is a critical thing. Their perspective, what they already know about a problem, how they view a problem, how they view some information, and their goals. Great, great place to start. The option would be to impose the designer's perspective. And I'll give you a classical example of this. And I'm not going to pick on Lorain County Community College because a lot of colleges' websites do this. If you have information about your school's programs grouped by academic division, all right? For example, here at LC, shame on me, I can't name all the divisions, I don't think, but I can name some of them. There is engineering, business, and information technology. That's one division. There is social sciences. There's um, um, health care. Um, there is math and science. 
Um, there are the humanities. I think that's like all of them. All right. Now, the question would be, let's say I wanted to become a video game designer. All right. And I wanted to take courses here. Which division do I look at? Who knows? I work here. I've worked here for 12 years, and I'm not 100% sure of the answer to that question. Right. And, and that's something they're, they're working on enhancing the site, and that's, looking, that's one of the things that they're looking at it to, to simplify it. And in a nutshell, they're looking to simplify by, again, viewing it from the user's perspective. In other words, computer gaming I specifically picked because that could fit into at least three of the categories, right? That could be part of arts and humanities, right? Because there's a lot of art involved in, and there's music and, and all that in computer games. Plus, a lot of computer games have storytelling aspects of it, too. So it could be in that area. It could be in engineering, business, and information technology because there's a lot of programming uh, d defined. It could be in math and sciences, believe it or not, um, because with games, oftentimes there are, you know, physics is performed, right? People even talk about the game physics, you know. You write a basketball game to shoot a basket, well, the basketball travels along a path guided by Newton's three laws of motion, right? Um, that's all I remember about physics, so we'll, that's where we'll cut off uh, there, all right? But the whole idea is, is it would be reasonable for computer gaming to be in any of those three divisions. Well, it's in one, right? You shouldn't have to know how the college is organized to find that information. You should say, I want to do computer gaming and be able to find it regardless of what academic division it, it, is, it is in. So, another that is not considering the perspective of the audience and their goals, but imposing the designer's perspective on it. In other words, here at the college, the person responsible for computer gaming is in the math and science department, so that's where the links appear, and that's where the information appears. Well, you know that if you work at LC, if you're a student from the outside world coming in, you might not be aware of that. All right? What's another guideline for well-designed websites or web pages? I would say here text as opposed to Okay. Tiered text. Uh, I'm going to write some comments here. The bad part would be a big chunk of text. All right. Now, what do you mean by tiered text? Uh, titles are a little bit bigger than subtitles. Subtitles are bigger than paragraphs. Um, you have the paragraphs broken apart by subject. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, if I can summarize that, um, have headlines for your text, have um, possibly subheadings for subsections of, of the text, have paragraphs um, that are of reasonable length that um, aren't giant run ons. Um, one thing that you did not mention, but that sort of fits on here, is where appropriate, uh, use lists, maybe, you know. Um, the one thing that people often say is that web pages are typically more scanned than they are read. In, in other words, people don't necessarily read a web page like they would read a book. They read a web page by scanning and looking for the pieces of information they're in. Because sometimes if people get to a page, they might want to know um, 
a, uh, you know, everything about the person. In other cases, they may only be interested in one thing. Let's say, for example, I'm interested in Igor Stravinsky and his piece, The Rite of Springs. The rights, the rights of Springs or The Rite of Springs? So I'll go to Wikipedia. So I'll look up Igor Stravinsky. He is the world's most popular Igor. So we'll pick him. All right. Let's see how quickly we can find it. by just scanning. Well, I couldn't see it in the headlines, but that might be a bit much to ask. But as I was scanning here, I see Somewhere in here, I actually saw it as I was scanning past. Ah, the Rite of Spring is noticeable, notable for blah, 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 blah. All right. Now, another way to define tiered text that David was talking about uh, is that you can look at it on whatever level of detail you want to. In other words, if you are interested in knowing everything about Stravinsky, you could read this from beginning to end. If you were just interested in one aspect of his life, you could go and hopefully go to that section and read that. In addition, the use of hyperlink is important, right? Because, find an example here. Yeah. The 19, here we go, reception. The 1913 premiere of the Rite of Spring. They mention this here. All right? So if I'm getting an overview of this, I read about that and read that that was an important event in his life. But it's a link. Well, what does that mean? That means that, well, if I'm interested, I could click on the link and read more about it. If I'm not interested, or if I already know what that is, let's say, it doesn't contain all that, all that text there. I can, I can choose to skip it if I'm not interested, or I can click on the link and read it. So that would be another aspect of tiered text. All right, so having text in, in order to be scanned so that you can easily scan through. Now what helps with that? Headings help with that. Um, possibly having different colors for things helps with that. Having blank space between things helps. Um, and using hyperlinks that allow you to let your users choose if they want to read an additional piece of information. In addition, the HTML tag aside can be used for that, right? Because the whole idea of aside is it's not the main article, but it's like something of side interest in the article. So, if think about it. And, and think again about design as being related to choices. To provide an appropriate level of text and detail on one page, we could do that a couple different ways. We could use lists. We could use the aside tag. We could have links to other pages. Later on, when we study JavaScript, we could have JavaScript code to show and hide portions of the page, depending on whether we click on it or not. 
how much text we put on a page before we put stuff on a second page. All these things are choices to make. There's technical ways to do it, and we have to decide which one of those technical ways we're going to do. But we know that this is a characteristic of, of good design. Um, it's funny because, you know, either way, you're going to have problems, right? If you put every sentence on its own page, then you'd have to clink, click through 200 links to get a complete biography of Stravinsky, right? But if you put every single piece of information about him on one page, then you'd have one gigantic page that you'd have to scroll through and not be able to find really what you wanted if you were only interested in one specific piece of information. So take advantage of what makes the web the web. Links and things like that and figure out a way to sort of balance those two. Yes? Oh, on a page? Yeah. That is a good question. I do not think so because that kind of behavior is typically going to be browser dependent to build in the ability. What you can do though is do something like this. Where you can put these internal links here and say, oh, I am interested in his religion. And you can jump right to that section. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he already right. Yeah, I, I don't believe there is. And the reason that I don't think it's feasible is because that's like browser dependent. Yeah. You could. You could. Um, it is tough to. It's very difficult to make assumptions about what your users know and, and, and don't know. Um, just telling them to do control F might be enough to confuse some users. So you, you know that you'd have to you'd have to balance um, that off. You know, and the, and the the people that it wouldn't confuse probably already know how to do it. So so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how I would do, but yeah, that's a good point. It would be actually great if you could, but I don't think that functionality is available. What's another example, well, or another characteristic of well-designed pages? Okay. All right. So let's put this up here, and I'll say effective I'll summarize this. Effective use of color. The would be ineffective use of color, which would be things like clashing colors, lack of contrast, too many colors, Maybe even too few. So can you give an example of what you mean about the colors flowing together and, and, and not confusing the user and things like that? Okay. 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 Well, number one is you do want to make it pleasing. Remember, we said it's not just about making it look nice, but we do want it to look nice. 
Number two is make sure that there's some rhyme or reason in the color scheme. You had mentioned that the links on the French site that we look, looked at were all, all yellow or all a certain color. All right. It would be really disorienting if you went to another page on that site and that color was used to mean something else. Right? Instead of being a link, it was a heading or something like that. All right? So be consistent with your choice of color scheme. All right? So that you're, in a sense, educating your user, teaching them, letting them know how your site's organized and how your site works. So that at a glance, they know what these things are. All right? And therefore, consistency is important, and not just with color schemes, but in positions of things. So, for example, if those links were in a different place on a different page, that could be disorienting. If you had three sale items, all right, one thing that you might do is make the signs for all the sale items a different color, right? Uh, the example given was in a retail store, the, the signs used and, and all that. Um, you might, you know, um, um, you know, indicate that with a certain color sign that that's a sale item. Because then, as users get used to that, they see that color, it's like, oh, that's a sale item. And we have to read that, yeah, this is a sale price. What did Kmart used to do to indicate their sale items? Boy, this is like, this is a, an age test, I think, maybe, because... Right, yeah, that's true too. Blue light special. They would have these literally blue lights, like almost like a police light, uh, and they would put it by areas that they were running sales on. So if you were a Kmart customer and you went there and you saw the blue light, you didn't have to think twice. You knew that there was a big sale on that sort of item. All right. So there was a consistency there. All right, and it always meant the same thing. Could you imagine that, you know, the outrage of customers if they started using a blue light to indicate that they sold out of an item, all right? Or a blue light to indicate that the price of this item has just gone up because of the manufacturer or something along those lines. No, they always use it the same way, all right? The one thing you mentioned as well is that too many colors simply disorient. You know, if you have a plain white background and black text and a couple color, a couple of paragraphs that are in a different color, let's say you have a couple paragraphs that are in red, immediately you think there's something special about those paragraphs. You know, there's something different about them. Because what kind of goes along with this thought is that Things that are different should look different. Things that are the same should look the same. If it's a link, it should look like other links. If it's a special, if it's a sale item, it should look like other sale items. All right? If it's a warning message, it should look like other warning messages. Now, could you imagine if a site where, like, every paragraph was a different color? All right? Then, the special colors wouldn't matter. You would, you, you know, even if you did have some kind of scheme in mind to say, well, the red ones are my warning messages, your overuse of color would um, sort of um, obscure your, your message from people. In other words, they wouldn't notice that that color was meant to mean something because you have too many colors. Now, on the other hand, not choosing any different colors also makes things tend to run together. So you do want some things to stand out. So use colors to indicate similarity between items and colors to make some things stand out as opposed to other things. So these are all good design guidelines. Your lab assignment that I believe that is due for next week involves you doing some research on the web and sort of extending what we've talked about in class today and what we'll talk about on uh, uh, Wednesday um, to talk about the uh, use of color, or I'm sorry, to talk about the use of design principles, including the use of color in designing a successful web page. Then finding a couple examples of pages that you think are 
effectively designed and, and uh, pages or sites that you think are effectively designed and sites that you think are not effectively designed. All right, we'll see you all.